uh, thank you, Cara. You'll probably all need a drink after this. <laughs> uh, it is right and proper, that, as you've probably just been hearing, that this talk be here. And of course, none of the trials that I'll be talking about before 1797 took place here. Um, corrupt judges and hostile juries. John Philip McCurran's defence of the United Irishman for libel and treason between 1794 and 98. St. Isidore's Church is the Church of the Irish Franciscans in Rome. Amelia Curran, a convert, is buried in its crypt. There is a plaque on the wall of the church which reads, and I quote, Amelia Curran was the most talented and virtuous daughter of John Philpott Curran, who fearlessly pleaded the cause of his country and his oppressed fellow citizens before corrupt judges and hostile juries. Hostile juries and corrupt judges were not the greatest problem faced by Curran and the other barristers who defended the United Irishmen and their sympathisers in the 1790s. They, and in particular Curran, uh, who was the most important defence barrister, faced professional damage, potential ruin, threats of being deprived of their silk gown, political and physical danger. In addition, Curran and other defence barristers and their clients unknown to themselves were under the handicap that a supposed friend and the most prominent junior counsel on the defence team was a spy for the castle who regularly informed the government and presumably its lawyers of the nature of defence briefs and tactics. Despite such handicaps, Curran not alone defended his clients without fear or favour, but at the same time advanced the rights of accused persons to a fair trial in the most adverse of circumstances by helping to establish and solidify the then uncertain rules of evidence and fair procedure. Curran and the instructions of his clients also used the trials to make a political case in favour of the freedom of the press and about his belief as the true causes of the 1798 rebellion, which he laid at the door of a repressive government. Curran consistently argued in his defences to criminal libel, felonies and treason charges that state repression could cause, and later did cause, rebellion, uh, and the failure to conciliate was the main cause of any sedition. In the treason trials, Curran also exposed, uh, to the popular scorn, the evidence of paid informers, which he portrayed as preventing a fair trial, and turned the, convictors, the, conviction, uh, the convicted into martyrs. I would argue that Curran did more, far more, to advance the cause of liberty than did any of his clients. Barristers only started regularly appearing for persons accused of crimes in the second half of the 18th century. Previously, most prosecutions were as a result of private informations laid against the accused and recorded as a true bill by a grand jury. Prosecutions were presented by lay people, the accused defended themselves. The judges told the jury the law and regarded it as their duty to ensure that the law was upheld and cross-examined witnesses themselves. The rules of evidence were lax or non-existence, hearsay was common, and any piece of evidence was allowed and left for the jury to evaluate. The rights of an accused to a fair trial were uncertain and ignored frequently. By the end of the century, however, judges were asking ju juries whether the Crown had proved its case and was there sufficient evidence to convict. While the standard beyond reasonable doubt was not formally established until 1824, the presumption of innocence was established and judges advised juries that if they had a doubt, they should acquit. Hearsay evidence was exposed, the evidence of informers and accomplices were criticised. Thus, the modern protections uh, of the civil rights of accused persons were established or were being formulated. Barristers were essential in this establishment and no one more central than current. The accused in criminal trials were prohibited from giving evidence in their own defence. It wasn't until 1924 that such evidence was allowed in Ireland. The rationale for this prohibition was that it protected the accused from self-incrimination and cross-examination. It originated when prisoners defended themselves. In trials for treason in Ireland up to 1765 and for all felonies in Ireland up to 1835, Council was officially confined to raising points of law to the judge. They were not permitted to address the jury on the merits of the case, but only on collateral issues. Leonard McNally, of whom we shall hear more later, referred in his work, Justice of the Peace, one of the first Irish criminal law texts, to, quote, the benevolence of the courts, allowing prisoners' counsel to cross-examine witnesses on trials 
for felony are observed upon the evidence. End quote. In misdemeanors and high treason trials, Curran was entitled, however, to enter on the merits of the case, but in felony trials, like that of all, uh, he was uh, confined uh, to uh, uh, making legal submissions. The, uh, the evidence, the jury was selected by uh, government appointed uh, sheriffs from those they believe sympathetic to the Crown. The accused in non-capital trials could only object for cause. Judges were, if not corrupt, certainly hostile. The evidence of only one witness was sufficient to convict for treason in Ireland until 1821. In England, at least two witnesses were required in treason cases since the Glorious Revolution. Curran would argue in the Jackson trial, quoting Cook, that the English statute was merely a restatement of the common law rule, and though the statute didn't apply to Ireland, but two witnesses were still necessary under the common law. In this argument, he was unsuccessful. After that ruling, Curran frequently praised the laws of England and applied, appealed to juries that they should apply the same high standards in Ireland uh, as applied in England, and not convict on the evidence of just one witness. But judges correctly reminded juries that in Ireland they could convict on the evidence of a single witness, and juries frequently did so. Counsel in treason trials were frequently faced then with the evidence of just one informer, the identity of whom the defence had no prior entitlement to know, who might swear that the accused had sworn him into the United Irishman on a certain date, or had advocated sedition at a meeting. And unless there was a witness who could contradict what was sworn, which was unlikely, all counsel could do was to attack the informer's credit by a witness as to credit, or discredit him by cross-examination or by oratory. In this task in Ireland, while the accused would be given details of the indictment in advance, there was no book of evidence, no list of witnesses. The accused might guess or receive intelligence as to who would be giving evidence against them, but surprise was part of the process, and counsel had to deal with these surprises in the course of the trial, which would typically finish within a single day. In England, as well as the evidence of two witnesses being necessary to secure conviction for treason, the names and addresses uh, of prospective jurors were furnished to the accused, as was a list of witnesses and their addresses. Curran said, in the contrast with the position in England, and I quote, the prisoner must have a copy of the jurors' names, by which he may eventually be tried. He must have a list of witnesses that are to be produced against him, that they may not vampire-like come crawling out of the grave to drink his blood. <laughs> As the 1790s progressed, the political situation worsened. After the war with France in 93, the United Irishmen became more identified with the enemy, leading to their suppression in May 94. The government, parliament and courts sought to suppress any dissent. Bills to reform parliament supported by Grattan and Curran were defeated and the Whig opposition in parliament rapidly weakened. In 1796, Parliament passed an Indemnity Act to provide an indemnity to persons who had used excessive force to suppress dissent, an Insurrection Act to give the government extraordinary powers to suppress rebellion, and in 1797, the Suspension of Habeas Corpus Act, introduced in the small hours of the morning, which, while temporary, uh, was regularly reenacted. Current saying, quote, the Habeas Corpus Act is almost the only remaining guardian of our liberties, and the Ministry have stabbed the guardian upon his post and in the dark. In fact, the 1782 Habeas Corpus Act, which was suspended, was expressed as only declaratory of the legal position. So its suspension in 97 didn't deprive the courts of their common law powers to order the production of prisoners, which they did in Wilton's case, famously, in November 98, and in 1799 in the case of three prisoners held without warrant in Wheatfield Jail. The Whigs unsuccessfully attempted to introduce Catholic emancipation in order, as they put it, to persuade the naturally conservative Catholics to oppose revolution. In 1797, after many defeats, Curran, Grattan, and most of the opposition withdrew from Parliament not to return until just before the Union. This then is the background of events before the rebellion. The government sought to suppress dissent, and the parliamentary opposition had failed. Before any treason trials, the government, parliament, and the courts all attempted to control newspapers and any dissenting publications. It was Curran's belief, articulated first in parliament and later as part of his defences, that it was the government's repression and failure to advance the rights of Catholics, which was the cause of what he argued was the reluctant dissent of the United Irishmen into sedition. 
Arthur Fitzgibbon, Black Jack Fitzgibbon, Earl of Clare, became Lord Chancellor in 1789. Uh, he used his personal and political animus against Curran to ensure that Curran lost his practice in the Chancery Courts, costing him an estimated £30,000, a vast sum. Whatever the great qualities Fitzgibbon had as a jurist, and they were many, his treatment of Curran and, it, and his potential clients demonstrated that Fitzgibbon was indeed a corrupt judge. Curran's effective banishment from the Chancery Courts, however, meant that he concentrated more on the criminal and the nicely pious arenas. The publication in the volunteer newspaper of an article calling the House of Commons a den of thieves resulted in Foster introducing a bill to Parliament ironically titled An Act to Secure the Liberty of the Press, which became important later. It required printers, proprietors and publishers to furnish their names and addresses on affidavit to the Stamp Commissioner and to lodge a bond of £500 as security and allow the rest of any, arrest of any newspaper vendor of any unstamped newspaper. Curran's first trials of political importance were in defence of criminal libel charges brought against various publishers, most of whom were United Irishmen, between 1794 and 97. Where the libel was directed against the government, parliament or the state, it was termed seditious libel. Criminal libel was a misdemeanor and therefore uh, the difficulties council faced in felonies did not apply. The council could fully address the jury. The government took exception to and wished to suppress publication of certain articles which they claimed were seditious and were encouraging revolution by the United Irishmen. Curran used a mixture of oratory, cross-examination and legal submissions to defend his clients. The first trial was out of Hamilton Rowan. Rowan was a United Irishman. After a United Irish Assembly was prohibited, and uh, they published in December 1792 an address to the volunteers, which called for parliamentary reform, emancipation, and for the volunteers to rearm to protect the Constitution. Rowan was charged with seditious libel. He had wanted sworn United Irishmen, uh, like Thomas Ennis, brother of Robert, to defend him, but he was persuaded to engage Curran on Curran's agreement to defend the address as published rather than with technical defences. The fellow publisher of the address, and later also an accused, Dr. William Brennan, complained on the 4th of January, 94, that Curran had yet to have any consultation with Rowan, saying, quote, Curran, though his lawyer, has never had two minutes conversation with him and only called one morning at his house on horseback and wouldn't delight. <laughs> the trial didn't take place until the 29th of January, 94, the year after his arrest. Arthur Wolfe, the Attorney General, argued that the address was, in, uh, not, it was in reality not to the old and revered volunteers of 1782, but was in code to sympathisers of the United Irishmen. He said that the use of the term volunteers in the address was, quote, a cloak for the creation of an armed banditti. Further, that the address with its call for art, to arms to defend the Constitution and for universal emancipation, a phrase Wolfe particularly emphasised, and in its demand for a totally reformed parliament was, in effect, seditious. Curran's speech was recognised at the time as being an outstanding piece of oratory. It was modelled on Cicero's Pro Malone. Curran was addressing the Anglo-Irish jury and also the United Irishmen that there was nothing in their creed that could not be accommodated in the existing constitution. The address to the volunteers, he maintained, was entirely compatible with the Whig constitution as guaranteed by the Glorious Revolution and reaffirmed by the 1782 settlement. In particular, Curran took ownership of the United Irishmen demand for universal emancipation, to which Wolfe took great exception. Curran started, it stated in a passage which became famous throughout the English-speaking world and became the headnote for chapter 38, Liberty, of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom Cavan, and I quote, I speak of the spirit of British law, which makes liberty commensurate with and inseparable from British soil which proclaims even to the stranger and the sojourner, the moment he sets foot upon British earth, that the ground on which he treads is holy and consecrated to the genius of universal emancipation. No matter in what language his doom may have been pronounced, no matter with what complexion incompatible with freedom an Indian or an African son may have burnt upon him, no matter what disastrous battle his liberty may have been cloven down, no matter with what solemnities he may have been devoted upon the altar of slavery, the first moment he touches the sacred soil of Britain, the altar and the god sink together in the dust, his soul walks abroad in her own majesty, his body swells beyond the measure of his chains that burst from round him, 
and he stands redeemed, regenerated, and disenthralled by the irresistible genius of universal emancipation. That passage and Curran's later peroration drew prolonged applause from the gallery. But there was no contradiction between, for any of them between being British and Irish. After the verdict, Curran's car carriage was unhitched and he was pulled by the crown crowd to his townhouse in Eli Place. The oratory, however, was of no avail and Rowan was convicted after the judge, Clonmel, charged for conviction. Rowan was imprisoned but later escaped and made his way to America. The Crown next prosecuted the proprietors of the Northern Star, a United Irish supporting newspaper, for the publishing on the 15th of December 92 of an address to the Jacobins of Belfast calling for reform and unity. The same edition also had carried the address to the volunteers in respect to which Rowan had been convicted, but the prosecution chose to proceed initially in respect to the Jacobins. The attorney, Wolfe prosecuting, adduced the necessary proofs of ownership against the proprietors via the affidavits they had sworn pursuant to the 1784 Act. Curran's approach was entirely different to the Romans' case, in that after the Crown case, he applied to have the case withdrawn from the jury on the basis that while a proprietor might be civilly liable on proof of ownership, that his clients could not be made criminally liable by mere proof of ownership, saying, quote, there is no law in this country by which every man entitled to share the profits of a certain trade shall be criminally responsible for the exercise of that trade by his agent, end quote. Legal argument ensued, <coughs> and eventually Clonmel dismissed the charges against Curran's clients, not on the reasonable grounds as advanced by Curran, but on an unargued and fanciful opinion which Clonmel had thought of himself. In those far off days, judges sometimes did that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> the next prosecution for criminal libel is against Dr. Crennan, one of the founders of the United Irishman, also from the publication of the Address to the Volunteers. Curran attempted to challenge a juror to John Trial for bias. He, having previously expressed an opinion on the case, Clonmel ruled, quoting precedent, that Trial could not be first sworn to be examined to establish his alleged bias, and as objections without cause were not allowed in misdemeanors, so Trial was sworn in as a juror and duly elected foreman. Wolfe opened the case to the jury and witnesses were examined. The main witness was William Carey. Under cross-examination, Curran uh, greatly undermined his credibility. Car Carey was, in fact, a very careful, perhaps too scrupulous witness. He admitted that he was a United Irishman who had proposed armed revolt, which had been opposed by Drennan. He agreed that he was hostile to Drennan because the United Irishman refused to pay for his defence of criminal charges. But and more importantly, under cross-examination, he failed to establish a firm connection between the paper as recorded in the indictment and the paper he said Drennan had handled. Curran's speech to the jury was another rhetorical tour de force. He exposed the weakness of the Crown's case in Carey's evidence, saying, and I quote, Punish a man in the situation of Dr. Drennan, and what do you do? What will become of the liberty of the press? You will have new the newspapers filled with the drowsy adulations of some persons who want benefits, or commissions in the revenue, or commissions in the army. He also spoke of the liberty of the press, quote, the liberty of the press is not for expressing merely an argument, but to convey the feelings of personal discontent against the government that the passions of the governors may be checked. Clonmel charged the jury that the address was clearly a criminal libel, but that there was some doubt as to publication. After 75 minutes of absence, which was a long time for juries in those times, the jury returned with a clearly reluctant verdict of not guilty. As the public gallery erupted in cheering, the foreman, Sir John Trial, added a statement of his own, and I quote, I despise the resentment and disregard the approbation of an unruly and seditious rabble, and I can assure them that they have no cause for exaltation in meeting favour from the jury, for they regret at seeing a criminal they cannot reach and guilt which they cannot punish. The government's determination to suppress their opponents manifests itself when having failed against Drennan and the Northern Star, they decided again to prosecute the Northern Star in respect to the same edition of 15th of December, 92. This time the article complained of was the address to the volunteers for which Rowan had been convicted and Drennan acquitted. This trial occurred on the 17th of November, 1794. The Crown witness from the Stamp Office was asked by Curran to produce the government supporting Belfast newsletter of the day before the offending star issue, which Belfast newsletter uh, issue contained the exact same address for which the star was facing prosecution. 
The witness then agreed that the address had appeared in a number of other unprosecuted newspapers also. Curran was able to demonstrate then the one-sided nature of the prosecution. At that time, newspapers regularly copied articles from rivals without attribution. Many papers had published copies of the address, but only the opposition paper was prosecuted. Curran said, it could not but appear but strange that if the punishment of guilt alone was the object of His Majesty's Attorney General, that the first party uh, who was guilty was not the first party charged. The jury returned a verdict saying that the defendants were guilty of publishing, but that there was no malice. Clonnell properly refused to accept that verdict and said the jury must find guilty or not guilty, and the jury then acquitted the defendants. <laughs> After the second defeat against the Northern Star, the government installed a spy, Mr. Byrd, in the newspaper, who gave what he later admitted to be false information against the proprietor of the Star, Mr. Nielsen, resulting in Nielsen's address and be denied bail. The paper continued under the Sims brothers, who received their instructions from Nielsen's cell by post. The paper's offices were raided by the military and the Sims brothers uh, were arrested, but also denied bail. When the paper managed to get official stamps to permit lawful publication again, the office was raided by the military, this time without a warrant, and the printing press destroyed, just thus closing the paper for good. The Lord Lieutenant commented that the raid was, quote, justifiable in the The Crown had been defeated in three of the four legal attempts to suppress dissident speech, but allowed its agents to ignore the law to achieve its ends. Curran's final defence of free speech was in the case of Peter Finnerty, the proprietor of the short-lived quality, liberal rather than outwardly United Irishman supporting newspaper, the, pe the Press. The Press was a significant irritant in the government, as the radical United Irish barrister William Sampson used it to supply information on government atrocities, which were then used by the English Whigs in Parliament to attack Pitt and support the narrative uh, of a cruel government causing dissent. On the 26th of October 97, the press published an address to the Lord Lieutenant, signed Marcus, condemning the failure to exercise the progress of mercy that the jury had recommended on the conviction of William Orr for administering an illegal oath. The circumstances of Orr's conviction, which we'll discuss shortly, drunkenness in the, sh in the jury room, a call for clemency by the jury, recantation of their decision by some jurors, and a widespread belief in his innocence led to outrage on his execution. Wolf again prosecuting advised the jury that the publication was a libel, the purpose of which was to render judges contemptible and odious to the people. The article was indeed seditious, saying in Geralia, quote, let juries remember that like Macbeth, the servants of the crown have waded so far in blood <coughs> that they find it easier to go on than to go back. Curran addressed the jury, I don't believe that the purpose of this speech was any real hope of convincing the jury to acquit, but rather to appeal to public opinion, and in this he was successful. Curran started by telling the jurors that they had been selected by the sheriff as being persons thought favourable to the Crown, ostensibly to remind them that their duty to their oath required all the greater scrutiny of the evidence, lest they seem biased, but actually, I think, to demonstrate the unfair nature of the trial. As with Rowan, the thrust of his speech was to emphasise that weak principles enshrined by the Glorious Revolution, confirmed by the uh, 1782 Constitution, necessitated, not merely permitted, liberty, and I quote. The power of the state is a trust committed by the people upon certain conditions, by the violation of which it may be abdicated by those who hold it, and resumed by those who control it. The liberty of the press is inseparably tied in with the liberty of the people, end quote. The jury convicted. Finnerty refused to divulge the identity of Marcus and was sentenced to a term of imprisonment, a fine and a spell in the pillory. The pillory was a wooden framework with holes for the head and the hands. The head had to be bent forward to accommodate the hands. The offender was then exposed to intended public ridicule before being imprisoned. However, such was the impact of Curran's defence that instead of being in the object of derision, Finnerty in the pillory was accompanied by many public figures, including Arthur O'Connor and Lord Edward Fitzgerald, and he was cheered by the crowd as a martyr. Treason briefs. In April 94, between Hamilton Rowan's trial of January, February 94, and the Northern Star trial of May 94, Curran defended a group called the Drogheda Defenders, who were charged not with high treason, but with inciting rebellion. The defenders were a Catholic secret society who would later find common cause with the largely Protestant United Irish. The judges advised the jury that the charges were being treated as a misdemeanor. 
Curran's defence was that the defenders were merely arguing for a Catholic relief, some of which had been granted the year before, in 1793, by Parliament. He pointed that the, 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 he painted the evidence against them as being tainted, and that organising for Catholic relief was entirely lawful. He was conscious, he said, of appearing before a Protestant judge and a Protestant jury. The jury returned a not guilty verdict. The political situation in 1794 was sufficiently peaceful for the Protestant jury to acquit their fellow countrymen. The first trial in Ireland for high treason for about 100 years was that of the Reverend William Jackson, which occurred on the 23rd of April 1795. Jackson, an Anglican clergyman, had been radicalised by the French Revolution. He visited France and returned to London with the intention of obtaining information as to the practicality of a French invasion and transmitting it to France. He subsequently went to Ireland with the same intent. He was assisted by his former solicitor, Cockaine, who, when in our England, wrote letters for Jackson of a treasonable character in a simple code. Cockaine then, it seems, to Price and reported to William Pitt, Prime Minister, all he knew, and was advised by Pitt to accompany Jackson to Ireland and report back. Jackson and Cockaine met Hamilton Rowan in prison, and a number of United Irish sympathisers, including the young barrister and protégé of Curran, Leonard McNally, who introduced Jackson to Drennan and to Wolf Tone. Tone had prepared a clearly seditious paper on the prospects of the French invasion. Jackson was charged with high treason and arrested in April 94. He had the capacity to testify against Tone, McNally, Drennan and others, and probably save himself, but he did not do so. Cocaine had and produced in court copies of Tone's memorandum um, and also the letters. Um, Um, he argued as a matter of law, current argument as a matter of law, that the common law required two witnesses to convict of treason, quoting Crook as an authority. Clonmel ruled against him, as we've said, seen, and then Curran urged the jury that they should not, in fact, convict on the lower standard than applied in England. The main force of his defence, however, was to discredit Cockaine. This Curran did. The historian proved no friend of the Curran or of Ireland said, and I quote, Curran's skill in torturing informers was as striking as his eloquence. He stretched cocaine as painfully as ever the rackmaster in the tower stretched a Jesuit. He showed if Jackson was a traitor to the state, cocaine was a far blacker traitor than a friend that trusted him. In his address to the jury, Curran analysed the specifics of the indictment and tried to suggest the evidence of cocaine, even if believed, did not establish the charges as set out. However, the letters cocaine produced as dictated by Jackson, clearly suggested seditious intent. And his main hope, if the jury was prepared to convict on the evidence of one witness, was to discredit Cockaine. And I quote, What do you think now of his character? <clears throat> he was a spy upon his friend. He was the man that yielded to the tie of three oaths of allegiance to watch the steps of his client for the bribe of government, with a pardon for the treason he might commit. And he had impressed upon his mind the conviction that he was liable to be executed as a traitor. Is it then on the evidence of a man of this kind, with his pardon in his pocket and his bribe, not yet in his pocket, that you can venture to convict a prisoner? The trial lasted until 4 a.m. the next morning. A verdict of guilty was returned with a plea for clemency given uh, the, the age of uh, uh, condition of Jackson. On the 30th of April, both the motion to arrest and the sentencing was arranged. There was no appeal, but a motion to arrest was a procedure to persuade the same court that had convicted the accused that there were legal defects in the trial or verdict. That day was probably the most dramatic day ever held in a court in Ireland. At the start of the day, Jackson, looking very ill, told McNally, quote, we have deceived the Senate. A reference which McNally understood to the play Venice Preserved, where the hero took poison to cheat his executioners. Jackson had, in fact, taken arsenic, and he knew that if he died before sentencing, his widow would be spared a tender or forfeiture of property, which was one of the consequences of a sentence for treason. Jackson's counsel, McNally, Ponsonby, and Curran, all engaged with what must be described as a forensic filibuster to prolong the arguments as to the deficiencies of the trial 
until their client had died. <laughs> While they were arguing, Jackson visibly worsened. And when Wolf demanded the sentence, Jackson stood up in the dock and swayed. Curran requested a postponement. Clonmel, the judge, refused. Curran and then Ponsonby made further arguments in bar of sentencing. And by the time they had finished, Jackson was unconscious. Wolf, always a fair prosecutor, agreed that the sentence should be postponed, but Clonmel, with Jackson expiring in front of him, still inquired if Jackson could hear the judgment so that sentence could be pronounced. <laughs> he was examined, but at this point he was pronounced dead. He had indeed defied the Senate. Clonmel had earlier proved himself a corrupt judge by imposing, before the time of his lecture, vast sums of fiats against persons who allegedly defamed some of his close friends. In default of uh, payment, they would face indefinite imprisonment. In his ruling of the Northern Star case, which we discussed before, he proved himself not an intelligence judge. In the Jackson case, he proved himself a heartless judge. Clonmel was the title given to John Scott on his elevation to the bench. And notwithstanding his information, Scott is probably today the most famous name of, his, uh, uh, of the period, as he was universally known uh, due to his sallow complexion by his nickname, Copperface Jack. <laughs> <laughs> After Jackson's sorry end, apart from it, this trial was notable for two separate matters. Firstly, the former ruling that only one witness was sufficient to establish treason in Ireland set the standard for further trials. One in former evidence, witness gave evidence. It was next to impossible to successfully defend the accused, especially as juries grew more hostile as the political situation worsened. The second consequence is that McNally, junior counsel, who must have believed he could have been implicated in treason by Cockhaven, became and remained for his life a paid informer. He had been entrusted by Jackson with his will and a letter to the French director, and he delivered both to the castle. Throughout his life, McNally conveyed valuable intelligence to his paymasters, while all the time enjoying the friendship and support of Curran. He was only one of the, an array of informers, including our other barristers like Francis Mangan, who orchestrated by uh, Francis Higgins, the Sand Square, and proprietor of the Freedom's Journey, which penetrated the United Irishmen and conveyed to the castle their every move. In December 95, Curran defended a group of seven Dublin defenders for treason, one of whom, James Weldon, was convicted and hanged. William Orr, a respectable Presbyterian farmer from Antrim, was arrested and charged with administering the oath of the United Irishman, which was a capital felony under the insurrection. The trial took place on Saturday, the 16th of September, 97, yes, Saturday. Curran was prohibited from addressing the jury on the merits, uh, as it was not a treason trial. Two soldiers who had allegedly been induced to take the United Irish oath were cross-examined, but remained steadfast in their evidence, though their credibility was attacked, one admitting that he had been an agent provocateur, both agreeing that they'd been paid £100, a tidy sum, for their services. The jury failed to agree a verdict, and they were locked up for the night, the Saturday. At about 6am Sunday morning, the jury returned, and in the presence of the chief judge, the Alberton, alone, Without counsel on either side, they asked could they bring in a qualified verdict. We're not sure Yelverton's exact words, but he directed that they must bring in a full verdict, guilty or not guilty. Eventually, they brought in a guilty verdict with a recommendation for mercy. On the Monday, Curran moved his motion to arrest, which then permitted him to address the court mm. on the merits. Mm. He made the case that the facts, if true, amounted to treason, and framing the indictment under the Insurrection Act was a device to prevent the full defence that would have been possible under a treason charge. He further argued, with justification, I believe, that the Insurrection Act had in fact expired and that it was no longer possible to maintain a conviction. Also, two jurors had sworn affidavits, swearing that strong drink had been introduced to the jury room, that some jurors were vomiting the drink, and one swore he, that he was, quote, by age and infirmity and intimidation induced to concur in the verdict contrary to his conviction. <laughs> Yelverton rejected all of Curran's points and sentenced Dr. to death, weeping as he did so. Dr. Drennan justly commented, I quote, I hate those Yelverton tears. The angel of mercy will not waft them to heaven, nor will God look kindly on them. 
The Elderton duly transmitted the clemency plea, but he declined to add his own recommendation. After three reprieves while the clemency plea was considered, Orr was finally executed on the 14th of October, 1797. His execution was regarded as a judicial murder, even by a number of government supporters, and resulted in the article in the press newspaper discussed previously, and the cry, remember all, was used by the United Irishmen in their rebellion the following year. Curran's final defence before the 98 rebellion was that of Patrick Finney, who along with 15 others was charged with treason on the, on the evidence of one informer, James O'Brien. O'Brien gave evidence of the unlikely story of being stopped uh, in Thomas Street, and he was advised that it, he was not safe until he uh, it took the United Irish oath, and that he was sworn in a room uh, where he heard talk of rebellion and the imminent French invasion, and he implicated all of the accused. Finney's case was the first of 15 to be tried, and was heard on the 16th of January, 1798. It being near impossible to establish a negative, the only possible way of exonerating Finney was to discredit O'Brien, and this Curran did. He started his cross-examination gently, indeed respectfully, getting O'Brien to describe his career as an assistant to a revenue officer, then establishing that O'Brien had indeed impersonated the revenue officer, quote, when I was in drink and the like, and then that he had collected revenues for his own benefit and pocketing, and later that he had engaged in the practice of coining, i.e. devaluing the currency by clearing silver off the coins. He was also exposed as having threatened to settle a defence witness and that he had earned money by blackmail. During the cross-examination, the defence was told of a witness living outside Dublin who would contradict a specific part of O'Brien's testimony. A coach was sent to fetch her. Curran got McNally to make the opening speech for the defence with instructions to keep it going for as long as it would take. Thomas Davis, in his collection of Curran's speeches, estimated that McNally spoke for about three and a half hours. <laughs> he was indeed a competent counsel. Uh, the witness arrived, gave evidence, and Curran embraced McNally in court, ironically saying, my old and excellent friend, I have long known and respected the honesty of your heart, but never until this occasion was I acquainted with the extent of your abilities in the court. It is possibly notable that when the witness was cross-examined, the Crown seemed to know a great deal about her, suggesting the possibility that McNally had advised them as to her identity. It wasn't until after McNally's death in 1820, three years after Curran, that news of his treachery emerged when his impoverished wife sought that his pension from the castle would continue for her benefit. His greatest service to the Crown was as the leading counsel for Robert Emmett, and where he fully informed the castle of Emmett's every move and of his intention not to contest the evidence. In his closing speech to the jury in the Finney case, Curran had little difficulty then in summarising O'Brien's deficiencies as a credible witness, and Finney was acquitted. Three days after, after that, the Crown withdrew their charges against the other 15 accused, and they were also formally acquitted. In July of 1800, Curran would go on to himself successfully prosecute the informer O'Brien for murder, and O'Brien was executed, quote, amidst the shouts and acclamations of an amazing number of people. Before the rebellion, Curran's central thesis was that his clients were only advocating the liberties granted or permitted by the Constitution, and revolt could be avoided. The jury and times that were still peaceful were sometimes prepared to give the benefit of the doubt to the accused. After the rebellion, Curran's clients were not so fortunate. The rebellion broke out, as we know, at the end of May 98. Before the outbreak, many of the ringleaders were arrested. Informers' information is crucial in this. Lord Edward Fitzgerald was arrested and fatally wounded on the 19th of May, and the Shears brothers on the 21st of May. During the rebellion, as is well known, there was much cruelty and lawlessness by the, the military, and rebels were uh, summarily executed. There were also sectarian atrocities uh, by the rebels, especially in Mexico. Courts martial were not the only form, were the only form of justice, and these were frequently seen themselves as being lawless. After the defeat of the rebellion, a general amnesty was granted for all who would surrender, except 76 or so ringleaders who were to be charged with treason. Curran was briefed in defence of all 76 who were to be charged by a special commission in rapid succession. The special commission consisted of judges and juries which were, and were established in order to give respectability to the trials as disgust increased over the use of a drumhead courts martial. 
The circumstances of these trials were not conducive to acquittal. On the 12th of July, the day of the Shears trial, the Freeman's Journal published a list of, of some of the Protestants who were murdered in Richmond. The pressure on Curran were immense. To go from one capital trial to another in a matter of a few days, the trials lasted sometimes over 20 hours without arrest. The accused had not formal knowledge of the case against him. This was unprecedented pressure. It must be said that the evidence was strong in most cases, assuming that the witness was to be believed. However, I do contend that the manner of Curran's defence was such that it assisted those in government who wanted an end to the executions and to effect the amnesty that ensued. The first day of the Shears trial, the 4th of July, was taken up with an application to discharge the prisoners on the basis that one of the members of the grand jury who had returned the true bill in the case was an alien and therefore not entitled to sit on a grand jury. This was an argument indeed thought of originally by McNally. It centred upon whether the office of grand juryman was an office of trust which under legislation required to be held by a subject and not an alien. The objection was, not surprisingly, overruled and the trial adjourned on 12th July. A copy of the detailed defence brief is extant. The interval was of use to the defence if the brief gave detailed instructions to counsel and is a model of its kind. During the trial, the judge, Charter, was so annoyed by the persistence of Curran's arguments in the case that he threatened he would be deprived of a silk gown. The case was opened by the attorney, now John Toller, Wolf having just been appointed Lord Chief Justice, directed him the attorney. The chief witness was a Captain Armstrong, who admitted being an effective free thinker uh, and an admirer of pain, and also admitted to brutalities during the rebellion, and said he had been introduced to the Shears brothers by a radical bookseller, and that they had disclosed their plans for rebellion. Ponsonby for John Shears argued the need for two witnesses on treason, with the same, and with the same results that would be fall the larger case in 1916, argued that one could, one could not compass the death of the king in London by conspiring to remove the viceroy in Ireland. After 16 hours trial, it was nearly midnight, when Curran, in this room, rose to speak, exhausted, and unsuccessfully asked for an adjournment until the next day. Toler, the attorney, later the infamous Lord Norbury, urged continuing, and Curran was directed to continue. The court was lit by candlelight. Curran spoke until dawn. His speech was addressed to the jury, but also to the people of Ireland, denouncing Armstrong on the basis that his, worth was, his oath was worthless as an atheist, and answering Toler's political appeal, saying to the jury in Ecuador, with what state of mind did you come here from your families? To do an act of great public importance, to pledge yourself at the throne of eternal justice by the awful and solemn obligation of an oath, to do perfect, cruel, cool, impartial and steady justice between the accuser and the accused? Or have you come abroad under the idea that public fury is clamorous for blood? Is it your opinion that bloody verdicts are necessary, that blood enough has not been shed? you will do more towards tranquilizing the country by a verdict of mercy." The Carlton sum, uh, summed up fairly, fairly, and after 17 minutes, the jury returned, found both brothers guilty. The trial lasted 23 hours. An appeal for mercy, which apparently it's given would have supported, had no effect, and the brothers were executed the following day. They took longer to die on the rope than the jury did to convict. Three days after the Shears trial, 17th of July, Curran defended John McCann, and three days after that, William Michael Byrne. Both were senior members of the Leinster Directory of the United Irishmen. Both were convicted, and McCann executed. The witness against all of these leaders who were tried was an arch informer, Thomas Reynolds, and Curran vigorously cross-examined him and exposed him as a robber, a swindler, uh, and indeed possibly a poisoner of his mother in law. It is believed <laughs> that uh, Reynolds was guilty under the attack. The next accused and the last to be tried was Oliver Bond. Curran again cross examined Reynolds, exposing his, unreliab his unreliability. And this time, a number of witnesses swore that Reynolds was not credible in his oath. During his address to the jury, from there, Curran was more than once in uh, interrupted by a clash of arms by soldiers who had assembled in the gallery. 
And once the soldiers approached Curran with menace, brandishing their arms, and Curran is reported to have turned from them, saying, you may assassinate me, but you shall not intimidate me. His speech, which was praised for his eloquence in the French official newspaper, Le Moniteur, was both a plea for moderation and a denunciation of vandals, and I quote, if juries are not circumspect to determine only by the evidence adduced before them, and not from any extraneous matter, not from the slightest breath of prejudice, then what will become of our boasted trial by jury? Then what will become of our boasted constitution of Ireland? You have been emphatically called upon to secure the state by a condemnation of a prisoner. I caution you against the greatest and most fatal revolution, that of the scepter into the hands of the informer. Bond was convicted, but the following day, the government started negotiations with the United Irish, which resulted in an offer by the prisoners, including Bond and Byrne, awaiting execution, to plead guilty and to make full disclosure of the United Irish Rebellion to a committee of the Privy Council, and that in return they would be reprieved and exiled. This occurred, and the tale they told the Privy Council was the version Curran espoused before and after the rebellion, that of reluctant revolutionaries being forced into a road by an intransigent government. It would not be the version favoured by Tone or later Republican hagiography, but it was the version espoused by the greatest by, by the great historian of the United Irishman, Madden, and by Robert Emmett's brother, Thomas Addis. The amnesty was favoured by Cornwallis, Castlereagh, and indeed Fitzgibbon, and despite opposition, it worked. The rebels went into exile and mostly into obscurity. That lesson would be lost 118 years later. The rebellion had been defeated, but as Kern had forecast, it made the union which occurred in 1801, almost inevitable. Curran, by his forensic skills after the rebellion, was unable to persuade any jury to acquit his client, but the nature of his oratory and the power of his cross-examination of Armstrong, and particularly Reynolds, he created the real possibility that future juries might no longer be prepared to convict, which would have fatally undermined the government's position and cast doubt on the guilt of those already executed. It's not clear what evidence the Crown would have had against the remaining accused. Curran's son, believes that they would have to rely on Reynolds. McNally had, uh, of course, refused to testify from below his cover. And lack of credible evidence, clearly, in my opinion, was a factor in the government's offer of amnesty. The authorities' desire to compromise was not universal. Lord Edward Fitzgerald had died of his wounds while resisting arrest. One of the penalties for treason, as we have seen, was a tender due to the corruption of blood, whereby the traitor's estate and any assets of his widow and children were forfeited to the Crown. Fitzgerald had not been convicted, but Toller, the attorney, introduced a bill in the House of Commons on the 27th of July, 98, to attain Fitzgerald and other persons not convicted. The same evidence was presented to the Committee of Parliament as had convicted Bond, and on the 20th of August, Curran, not a member of Parliament, spoke at the bar of the House of Commons against the bill on behalf of Lady Pamela Fitzgerald and her three children, the eldest of whom was just four. Curran's point was that the presumption of innocence was paramount, and Parliament could not speculate on guilt, I quote. I was asked by the committee if I had any defence to go into. I was confounded by a question which I could not answer, but upon a very little reflection I saw that in that very confusion, the most conclusive proof of the injustice of the bill. Sir, I now answer the question. I have no defensive evidence. I have no case. It is impossible. I should often of late have gone to the dungeons of the captive, but never have I gone to the grave of the dead to receive instructions for his defence, nor in truth have I ever been at the trial of the dead man." End of quote. The bill was, however, passed and became law. Fitzgerald's estates were sold, but they were purchased eventually by his stepfather, Ogilvy, and restored to his widow. The attainer was there formally reversed in 1819, Lady Pamela died in poor circumstances in 1831. As we have seen, uh, Tone was allowed to go into exile in America during the Jackson trial. He, he was considered to be not a very important person. He left America for France, enlisted in the French uh, army, and persuaded the director to launch an invasion attempt at Ireland in autumn 98, after the rebellion had been defeated. The French fleet uh, was interrupted uh, intercepted off Dunning Hall, and Tone captured, and in the uniform of France was brought to trial by court martial on the 10th of November, 1798, just over 225 years ago. 
He admitted the facts, but pleaded his French commission. He was convicted and sentenced to death, which was fixed for the 12th of November. But the night before, he attempted suicide by slitting his throat and was not immediately successful. Meanwhile, Curran was attempting to save his life. He had failed to get any help from those who might have expected to support, like Kyo, the Catholic leader, or other United Irish sympathisers. On the 12th of November, the day fixed for execution, Curran, acting alone with Tone's aged father, who had sworn an affidavit by his side, went before Lord Kilwarden, the Chief Justice of the King's Bench, the former attorney, Wolf, and he sought and obtained an order of habeas corpus. The grounds of the application were that essentially courts martial were illegal at a time when the ordinary courts were available, and that therefore the conviction was invalid. Kilwarden appeared to believe that there was much strength in that proposition. The sheriff was ordered to proceed to the barracks and ensure that the execution was suspended and Tone brought before the court. The writ was served, but the authorities initially refused to release Tone. Kilwarden then ordered the arrests of the relevant authorities and was then told that Tone could not be moved as he had severed his windpipe. Kilwarden ordered to help halt to his execution and Tone died of his wounds on the 19th of November, 1798. Curran did not argue for the innocence of Tone but he hoped at least to buy some time so that an exchange of prisoners might be arranged, or at least, and less likely to succeed, to argue that the, as the Crown had elected to, pro to proceed by court martial, they couldn't have a second trial. Remember that for Curran, though he blamed the rebellion on the intransigence of the government, and Tone was a former colleague, the very fact of the rebellion meant an end for all that he believed. Whatever the rebellion might have achieved, and I have of the view that even if it had been coordinated, it was almost certain to fail. The only thing, the one thing that was definitely ended by the fact of rebellion was any hope of uniting Catholic Protestants and dissenters. Such unity would have required the United Irishmen to compromise on separation and the Protestant nation to have compromised on reform and emancipation. Curran knew that the union was made almost inevitable by the rebellion and his position in society was severely damaged by his agreeing over the years to accept the briefs on behalf of the United Irish leaders, but he didn't hesitate. In his final speech to the House of Commons in May 1797, Curran had spoken in defence of the independence of the power and equity. I am censured heavily for having acted for them in, in the late prosecutions. I feel no shame at such a charge, except that at such a time as this, to defend the people should be held out as an imputation upon a king's council when the people are prosecuted by the state. I think every council is the property of his fellow subjects. If indeed, because I wore his majesty's gown, I had declined my duty, or done it weakly, or treacherously, if I had made that gown a mantle of hypocrisy and betrayed my client, or sacrificed him to any personal view, I might perhaps have been taught wiser by those who have blamed me, but I should have thought of myself the basest villain on earth. But remember too, Kilwarden, the judge, though a friend of Curran and a fair prosecutor, he was a convinced supporter of the government. He opposed parliamentary reform and Catholic emancipation and would go on to favour the union in 1801. A rebellion had been defeated. Tone, a kinsman, had not gone into exile quietly as he had seemingly agreed. Tone had instead attempted an invasion with the army of the king's enemy. The threat of further invasion was real. Nobody argued for the innocence of Tone. Yet Kilwarden was prepared to order the production of the arch traitor's body, and just because the rule of law had been violated. I would suggest Curran's faith in the rule of law was not misplaced. Even hostile, non corrupt judges could be counted upon to administer universal emancipation in the most adverse of circumstances. As I stated, Curran advanced the cause of freedom and of human rights more than any of his clients. Of his clients covered in this paper, Jackson, or Weldon, the Dublin defender, and the Shears brothers, and Patrick McCann were executed. About 10 broader defenders, Finney and his 15 co-accused, were acquitted, and over 70 leading United Irishmen were spared execution. A very impressive success rate. 
While Curran's thesis that the Constitution was sufficient to guarantee the liberties the radical wanted did not resonate with either the government or the United Irishmen, his exposure and torture of informers confirmed the belief that those convicted were martyrs. Curran ensured that in the most adverse of circumstances, the independence of the bar and the rule of law were not alone <laughs> preserved but strengthened. In England, Lord Erskine and Garrow were doing much the same for the rights of the accused, but I suggest in much easier circumstances. After Curran's death in 1817, the English newspaper of the day and New Times stated in a quote, when Erskine pleaded, he stood in the midst of a secure nation and pleaded like a priest at the temple of justice with his hand on the altar of the constitution and all England below prepared to treasure every fantastic oracle that came from his lips. Curran pleaded, not on the floor of a shrine, but on a scaffold, on a scaffold. That is Curran's legacy, on a scaffold. You are his legatees. Guard your inheritance.